okay we'll get started so we were discussing about uh, correlated random variables in the previous class when two random variables have some relationship with each other so we talked about joint distribution we talked about marginal and we talked about conditional distribution okay so i'll just write down the expressions once again so that way uh, we can refer to it again so this is the joint distribution and it is equal to p y2 given y1 p1 of y1 and it's also equal to p y1 given y2 p2 of y2 <clears throat> today i want to talk about uh, two more things and then we'll move on to the continuous uh, continuous case setting so right now we were doing it with discrete omega so omega was a discrete set but uh, we'll talk about omega equals to continuous set in today's class uh, before we finish some of the other things <clears throat> so i'm going to define expected value which is not very different so expected value of g of uh, okay maybe i'll write x1 and x2 this is given by summation x1 and x2 g of x1 x2 p of x1 x2 the conditional expectation is given by expected value of g of x2 given x1 is equal to or maybe i can write it there itself summation over all x2 g of x2 p of x2 given x1 okay so uh, the the definition of expected value of jointly distributed uh, function of jointly distributed random variable is basically the same expression it's not different than what you would expect for expected value of just a single random variable um and then the conditional expectation the only important thing to note here so this is a new definition this is something you may not have seen it earlier um unless you've taken a course on on probability or statistics so in this case you have the conditional expectation so i want to find out what the average value of g of x2 is so g is some function g is some function from um x2 could be r to r or omega to r so in this particular case i want to know that if i have observed x1 if i know what the value of x1 is what is the mean value what is the average value of g of x2 and that is given by g of x2 multiplied by 
the conditional probability of x2 given the value of x1 that I'm seeing. And this summation is over all x2. So notice this summation here is over all x1 and x2, whereas this summation is only over x2. Okay, important thing to note. Okay, uh, some of these conditional expectation stuff is needed in uh, maybe two or three class classes later when we talk about Kalman filtering. But right now we don't have to worry about it. Basically the context in which we are going to use it is, if I know what the rotation sensor is saying, what is the velocity of the vehicle, right? So we want to find out what the conditional expectation is. And sometimes in those cases what happens is, uh, Sometimes you just don't want to know the velocity. Sometimes you have functions of velocity. So you want to know that information as well. And so this conditional expectation allows you to compute uh, everything about uh, any function of the other random variable that you're not able to observe, but you're only observing some limited part of the random variable. And on that basis, you want to estimate what something else is going to be equal to. So that's how you compute it. Now the most important thing is covariance. So we didn't talk about covariance. Have we talked about mean? Uh, I mean mean you already know, mean is expected value of x1, which is summation of x1, p1 of x1. This summation is over all x1. And I'm going to divide, denote it by mu1. And I'm going to denote it by mu2. I don't think we talked about the mean uh, yesterday, but again, this is something you've seen earlier. So this is the marginal on x1 and I'm just going to multiply it by the value of x1, uh, take the entire sum, I get the average value of x1, and same way I get average value of x2. Now the question is, what is covariance? How, are, how is covariance defined? So we denote it by Covariance of x1, x2, this is the expected value of x1 minus mu1, x2 minus mu2. I'm assuming here that x1 and x2 are both scalar valued random variables, which means that they take values in Real, uh, real line or natural numbers. Sometimes you have covariance of x1 and x1. Just give me a second. What happened? Yeah. yeah. This is known as variance. Yeah, mu1 is correct, thank you. So x1 minus mu1, x2 minus mu2 here, and here you have x1 minus <coughs> mu1 square. 
OK. Now, sometimes when x1 and x2 could be Rm, x2 in Rn, then the mean and covariance is computed in exactly the same way. No, sorry, mean, mean is computed exactly the same way. The covariance of x1, x2 is given by transpose. So there is a transpose here, which you should notice. Not quite right. I should probably add an omega here. OK. So these are just the expression. So we had seen one example in the previous class when we were talking about this temperature of the room example. So DL264 and DL260, uh, no matter what function you pick, we, we know exactly what this value looks like. We know what this value looks like. We had computed it in the previous class. Now, you can compute all of these quantities just by going through the same set of uh, expressions again and again. OK, so you know how to compute the expectation of functions of two variables. Here is a function of two variables. You can compute the expectation using that expression. Here is a function of one variable. You can compute the expectation in a usual fashion. And then these are some things that you already know how to compute. And if x1 is a vector, all you have is a vector multiplied by a scalar, sum it up. You have a vector here multiplied by a scalar. You sum it up, you get mu2. So these, are also, these also become vector in that case. OK. So, so far we were looking into the case where omega was a discrete set, right? So, all of this is summation. Okay, these are summation. Uh, you see everywhere we are writing it as a summation. Now, the goal is to try and figure out what happens if omega is actually a continuous set. By continuous, what I mean is it's a subset of Rn. In that case, what do we do? It'll turn out uh, there will be some minor changes in the way the expression looks. Um, but all of these summation will then convert into integral. OK, so these summations will convert into integral. And then we will uh, be able to evaluate all this stuff. The expression is going to remain the same, except that all the summation will get converted into integral. So let's see what happens in those cases. Any questions so far on this stuff? OK. So if you recall our uh, the when we were discussing uh, examples of distributions, uh, we also discussed the example of distributions over continuous random variables. So here omega could be r, x of omega equals to omega itself. And one of the assumptions we are going to make in throughout this particular uh, semester uh, is that the distributions will be will have a density function so we assume a density function f maybe i should write uh, x1 of omega and x2 of omega equals to omega 2 and omega is r2. For the time being, let's just consider the case where omega has two dimensions. 
and x1 of omega is just the first element of omega, x2 of omega is the second element of omega. This density function will map R2 to R or maybe not, I shouldn't say R, it should map to 0 to infinity. And we will denote this uh, probability that x1 is in A, x2 is in B, is given by A cross B, f of x1, x2, dx1, dx2. So A is a subset of R, B is a subset of R. Okay, now we need to do the same thing. We have the joint distribution. This is the joint probability density function, PDF. This is the joint PDF. We need to do the same thing. We need to find out what the marginal PDF is and what the conditional PDF is. So let's try to find it out. I have a uh, This is the marginal PDF. Same thing F2 of X2 is, if I take the integral with respect to X1, I get F2 of X2. This is the marginal PDF of X1. This is the marginal PDF of X2. And then the conditional PDF. X2 given X1. Okay, so going back to this, we have uh, two random variables, x1 and x2. Uh, we will assume that there is a density function f, small f, which maps the points in the space R2 to between a number between 0 and infinity. Uh, the way you define the probability of x1 being in a set A and x2 being in a set B, you need to take the integral over the set A cross B of this particular uh, function. So that defines what the joint probability distribution is going to be. So the PDF induces a joint probability distribution over x1 cross x2. And this is how you compute the joint probability distribution. Remember in the case of uh, discrete x1 and x2, 
I was using p x1 and p x2, there was no integral and we were doing summation. The only difference here is this is called a probability mass function, this is probability density function and by density what we mean is we need to have an integral with respect to dx1, dx2 and this integral can generally be computed with you know whatever integral methods you have seen in calculus. You can compute these integral and you can evaluate what the joint probability distribution looks like over A cross P. Marginal, just integrate with respect to dx2, you get uh, marginal on x1. You integrate with respect to x1, you get marginal on x2. Conditional PDF, also you can find out by just taking the ratio. So all of this basically mimics the same set of steps you had taken for p of x1, x2 with some minor changes that now you have to do some integral operations rather than just summing it up or, or, or uh, taking the ratio. So that's the only difference here. Any questions so far on this? Okay. Now the expected value of a function g of x1, x2 is basically integral r cross r g of x1, x2 f of x1, x2 dx1, dx2. And the conditional expectation is given by this expression. So what's the expected value of g? x2 given that I observe x1 given by this expression. The case that will be most interesting to us would be the case where x1 and x2 are jointly Gaussian distribution and we will spend maybe a, a, a good part of this lecture as well as another lecture on joint distribution in which both random variables are jointly Gaussian. So f will have a very specific functional form and then uh, we'll use that functional form in order to come up with understand what the jointly Gaussian distribution, like what these uh, PDFs look like. Uh, a lot of things simplify in the case of Gaussian. If it is non-Gaussian, things may not be simple. Each of these integrals may be very difficult to evaluate. These things may be very difficult to evaluate if things are not Gaussian. But for the Gaussian case, all of this gets simplified because of which we study Gaussian more easily. You know what the benefit of simplification, so of course you can assume if, you, if, if as long as the random variable has some properties of a Gaussian distribution, you can assume that the random variables are Gaussian. And then after that, all of these equations become easier. So it becomes very easy to write the code in microcontrollers or in uh, PLCs. Very easy to write the code in order to execute some uh, function. Uh, if you start figuring out what the actual distribution is and try to fit a more complicated distribution for the random variables, then these expressions become too difficult and then you won't be able to write a code uh, to execute those processes. So that's primarily the reason why we assume most of the noises are Gaussian. So if you look at the vehicle, like we were talking about you know, the vehicle rotation sensor, the tire rotation sensor and the vehicle velocity, so typically, the assumption there would be that the noises that you see both on the velocity side uh, 
or on the sensor side, uh, you would assume them to be Gaussian dis uh, distribute. Uh, they'll be Gaussian distributed because it just makes your life so much easier. So let's look at the specific case where uh, these uh, vectors x, I mean these values, variables x1 and x2 are jointly Gaussian. So what these values turns out to be. Okay, so the reason why I'm not going too deep into this particular part is because for the Gaussian we will be doing all of this uh, anyways. And for other uh, random variables with, uh, uh, with continuous density, we won't be evaluating these integrals or these things in the class. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing it in the assignments either, but I want you to know and recognize that in many other cases, you may not get nice Gaussian distributed random variables, in which case you will have to spend a lot more effort trying to evaluate these integrals. So what is so cool about Gaussian distribution? We will directly go to the vector case because I don't want to go over the scalar case and then go over the vector case again because the expressions are very similar. So what is the setting? My omega is Rm cross Rn. My x1 of omega is, I don't know, the vector omega 1, which is in Rm. My x2 of omega is in is omega 2 which is in Rn. The means are will be denoted by mu 1 and mu 2 and the covariance sigma 1 1 sigma 1 2 Let me call this mu, let me call this sigma. Can someone go through your notes and tell me what the density function f looks like for this particular case? It's already there, we have, we have discussed it in the classroom. I want you to go back into your notes and tell me what the density function is. No, we are just looking at the joint distribution. What is the joint distribution? Yeah, you want to determine, determine it? There is the kth root, right? Yes. 
what is the determinant? What? 1 over k? 1 over n plus m? What is it? Yeah, so 2 pi raised to n plus m. So k here is n plus m, right? So this is 2 pi raised to k and then what? Determinant of sigma? What? No? Nothing else? Okay. Is it in the square root or not in the square root? In the square root. In the square root? Okay. So we have this and then? Right? Okay. This is my vector x. Okay, so uh, going back to the typical vehicle example, uh, this could be like the four rotation sensors on the four wheels. That will give you like different, the rotation values of the wheels. And then x2 could be the velocity of the vehicle itself. Okay, so you get like readings from the four. So m is four there and n is equal to one because you are only interested in the velocity. Uh, sometimes you also have an engine speed not sometimes, uh, you can go to your car dashboard and you will also see an engine speed. That sensor comes from the engine itself. What translates, what's the correlation between engine speed and the wheel speed? What correlates the engine speed to the wheel speed in a vehicle? Have you heard of the term gearbox? Gear ratio, if you have the gear ratio, you can determine the wheel Correct. Speed. So you have the gear ratio, so it, every vehicle has a gearbox. The gearbox basically translates the, uh, the engine rotational speed into the rotation uh, of the wheels. So those two are correlated and the gearbox actually correlates the two random variables there. So engine speed to the uh, vehicle, uh, the, the rotational speed of the wheels. So in some sense, if you look at the vehicle, uh, when you press the accelerator, you increase the fuel injection into the engine. The engine's rotational speed increases. That goes through the gearbox and that translates into the rotation of the wheels. So you can add as many random variables as you want here. You can have the rotation speed of the engine. You can, well, gearbox is something that is controlled by a logic uh, or, you, or in, in the manual. How many of you have driven a manual car before? Only one? Okay. Do you guys drive or you don't drive? drive? You do drive, okay. But you have automatic, okay. So in automatic cars, there is a logic that translates the engine speed and the vehicle velocity into what gear ratio to use. But in the case of manual, you actually determine what the gear ratio is going to be. And on that basis, the speed and the rotational speed of the vehicle and all of that thing gets decided. So anyways, going back to the example, this is R4. I'm getting the rotation speed from four different sensors on the four wheels of the vehicle, and then I have the velocity. And let's say I've done a lot of experiments, and I've figured out what the value of mu and what the value of sigma is going to be. Now I want to, uh, so that gives me the, uh, the uh, probability density function. Now what is important is I want to figure out what my F1 of X1 is, what my F2 of X2 is, what my F of X2 given X1 is, and what my F of X1 given X2 is. So I want to know all of these four, uh, the, the marginals as well as the conditional distributions based on this, cap, this uh, function, density function. Now, of course, you can do the integration and all that to figure those things out, but actually, uh, people have already figured it out long time back, maybe in 1800s. So, this is what it uh, turns out to be. 
So one property of Gaussian distribution is, you know what the distribution is just by knowing the mean and the covariance. So as a result of which, F1 of, of X1 is actually very simple. It is So all you have to do is replace sigma by sigma 1, 1, replace mu by mu 1, and of course x gets replaced by x1. Here you have sigma 1, 1 inverse, and here you have 2 pi raised to m, because remember, x1 takes values in rm. So that m is also appears in the exponent of 2 pi. Okay, so, so computing the, uh, the marginal is actually very easy. All you need to know is what the expected value of x1 is and what the expected value of, what the covariance of x1 is. So that gives you the, the expression for the marginal. Now, of course, you can also integrate this and you can get exactly this expression, but integrating it is far more difficult. Um, but you can verify. If you are able to do the integration, you can actually verify that this is exactly what f1 of x1 looks like. So a few things to remember. Any Gaussian distribution is completely characterized by the mean and the covariance. That's it. So all you need to know is mean and covariance. You plug it into this formula, you get the marginal. So same thing. Replace x2, replace 1 by 2 here, and then replace this 2 pi raised to m with 2 pi raised to n, and you get f2 of x2. Now the important thing to know is, what is the conditional distribution here? What is f of x2 given x1? Now the, the amazing thing in the case of jointly Gaussian distribution is that x2 given x1 is also Gaussian distributed. What this means is if x1 and x2 are jointly Gaussian, I only observe x1. I don't observe x2 at all. Given x1, the distribution over x2 is actually also going to be a Gaussian distributed random, random vector. The way to see this is, you have the joint distribution here, you have the marginal here, divide this by this, you get the distribution of x2 given x1. Okay. Now of course this, uh, doing that operation is again very far more complicated, I mean it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, as follows, because this is Gaussian distributed, all I have to do is figure out what the mean of this value is and what the covariance of this particular value is. So it turns out that expected value of x2 given x1 is given by mu2 plus sigma21 sigma11 inverse x1 minus mu1. And then covariance of x2 given x1 
Okay. So I have x1 and x2 that are jointly Gaussian. I have x1 and x2 that are jointly Gaussian. I can compute the marginal by just knowing what the mean and the covariance is. I want to compute the conditional distribution. So for conditional distribution, I have to do this division, uh, which is going to be time consuming. But what I know from my knowledge about Gaussian distribution is that turns out x2 given x1 is also Gaussian distributed random variable. So if I divide this by this, I'm going to get a density function which is going to look like uh, exactly one of these density functions. I mean, it's going to look, it, it's going to be in this particular format. Now, what is going to be the mean and what is going to be the covariance of that particular conditional distribution? So remember, mean appears here, the covariance appears here. So if you do that division, what you will notice is that this is the mean that appears and this is the covariance that would appear in this particular region. And that's what gives you the, the expected value as well as the covariance of uh, the conditional distribution. The other thing to note here is that what you are doing here is you are subtracting mu1, you are subtracting the average of x1, uh, mean of x1 from the reading of x1. So I'm reading the temperature of this room, it is 87, maybe today it is 75 degrees Fahrenheit because the AC is not working. So, but on an average, the room temperature is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, on an average. So I'm going to subtract from 75, I'm going to subtract mu1, which is 72, and I get the value 3. Then I have sigma11 one one inverse gets multiplied by 3, then I multiply it by sigma21, and then I add it to the average temperature of the room in DL260, which might be 71. And so I have 71 plus this matrix multiplied by three. And that gives me that knowing that the temperature of this particular room is 75, what is the average value of the temperature in the other room? That gives me, that comes from this expression. And then the covariance is what's the variance in that particular temperature. Given that I know what X1 is, given that I know the temperature of this room, what's the variance of the temperature of the other room is? There is one important thing to note here. The important thing to note here is, if you did not know x1, okay, there is no conditioning, then the covariance is actually going to be sigma 2, 2. So covariance of x2 and x2 is sigma 2, 2. But now that you know x1, there is a reduction in the covariance, okay? So this is the original covariance, but because I know x1, I have observed x1, there is a, a reduction in the covariance by this much amount, okay? So depending on the value of sigma21, depending on the covariance of the random variable 1, you can compute what the, uh, how much reduction there will be in the uncertainty about x2. Going back to the example of the wheels, so I have four rotation sensors. Given that I know what the value of those four rotations are, how much is the uncertainty in the velocity of the vehicle? And typically those uncertainties are going to be very low. So if you do not observe the rotation sensors, right? So I'm not observing, I don't know what the rotational speed of the, of the tires are. What can I say about the velocity? It could be anything. It could be zero, it could be 50, it could be 100 miles an hour. I just don't have any way to know. So the covariance is going to be very high. Once I figure out, once I have the sensor reading about the rotation speed of the, of the tires, I can very accurately predict. What do I mean by very accurately? What I mean is, I can of course compute the mean, which is what the velocity, what, what is shown on the dashboard. But the other thing that is not shown on the dashboard is the fact that actually the covariance is very small. Okay, so initially the covariance was very large. I don't know whether the vehicle velocity is zero. It could be zero, 50, or 100. I really don't know. And it's a very wide range. So the covariance is very high. But as soon as I know what the rotation sensors are doing, what the numbers are, 
once I do the subtraction, the covariance turns out to be very, very small. Okay? So across the entire autonomous system spectrum, you design sensors and you design, you understand some of these correlations very well so that you can measure things that you really cannot measure without. Uh, uh, so, okay, so let's look at, again, going back to the vehicle example. So you have an autonomous vehicle and you want to know what the velocity of autonomous vehicles are. What all are the sensors you would use? So one of them is, of course, the vehicle uh, tire rotation sensor, right? So you have the rotational speed of the tires. What other value are you going to use for measuring the velocity of the vehicle? You can use GPS, right? So, in fact, on my uh, Google Maps, Google Maps estimates what the velocity of my vehicle is based on you know the successive GPS location of the vehicle. So you can use GPS. So with GPS is a completely separate sensing capability, right? So you have a completely different sensor which also gives you the same information about the vehicle velocity. What other things can you use for measuring the vehicle velocity? Without speed sensor, without that tires. I mean, tires and GPS is already done. What other things can you use? Actually, you can you can determine the speed by engine speed. Engine speed, if you know the gear ratio. If you know the gear ratio and engine speed, you can figure out what the velocity of the vehicle is. Great. Anything else? Right. Perfect. So you can use IMU. Although I, uh, okay. Very good example. When you are in the tunnel, the way to measure the vehicle velocity is through IMU because it's a GPS denied environment. You cannot know what the velocity of the vehicle is using GPS signals. So the only two reliable, reliable ways of measuring that velocity is either you use the rotation sensor or you use the IMU, okay? So IMU is basically a bunch of accelerometers and then you integrate the accelerometers reading in order to get the velocity of the vehicle. Uh, it has a lot of problems though, but, but yes, it's a legitimate way of measuring the velocity of the vehicle. What other things can you use? <clears throat> I'll give you another example. So you use optical flow methods. You can use optical flow methods as well. So you know vehicles have cameras. So when the cameras are capturing the photo of the road, and if you know at what angle that camera is capturing the photo of the road, and how the photo changes from one frame to another, you can again know what the velocity of the vehicle is. Okay, any other way of measuring the velocity? You can measure the uh, ambient noise under the vehicle, and you can do the fast Fourier transform of that noise, and typically the noise is again proportional to the speed of the vehicle. If your vehicle speed is very slow, the noise is very low, if the vehicle speed is very high, the noise is very high. So that's another way to measure the velocity of the vehicle. So as you can see, depending on, uh, okay, so now, now we understand like there are so many different ways of measuring the velocity. Actually, uh, I know in signals and systems class, one of our colleague actually gives this homework assignment. So he has measured the voice, like the, the noise that comes out of the road while he's driving the vehicle and it's an assignment problem to figure out what the velocity of the vehicle is. Okay, so <laughs> uh, you get a crude estimate, but you do get an estimate of the velocity. Okay, so now let's say the GPS has been hacked. You know, we have sent you this information about GPS foofing. So let's say the GPS has been hacked. Uh, what you can do is you can remove, if you know that it is hacked, you can remove the GPS signal from this conditioning variable and you can still get the estimate for the velocity of the vehicle using all the other sensors that you might be using to measure that velocity. So, so anyways, like there are multiple ways, there are multiple sensors or multiple ways to compute the velocity of the vehicle. You're measuring all of them. And as long as they are jointly distributed, all of them are jointly distributed random vector, you can use these methods to compute what the velocity of the vehicle is and stronger the correlation between what you measure and what you want to know, uh, lower this covariance, like the covariance is going to become lower by that much amount, and you will have better and better uh, 
confidence on the velocity of the vehicle based on the sensor readings. Something to keep in mind, this reduction is actually extremely important from the point of view of an autonomous system. You really want that, that value to be as close to zero as possible, which basically means that you very reliably know what the value of x2 is now that you have measured x1. Okay. So then, uh, what is the what is the f of x2 given x1? So let me f of x2 given x1. I'm going to call this mu of two given one, and I'm going to call it sigma 2, 2 given, okay, this is not looking good. I have to give it a different name. C2, C2, 1, what should I call this matrix? I don't know, M2, 1. Okay, so this is given by Remember, I just have to substitute the sigma here and mu here with the updated uh, mean and the updated covariance. So that is one over square root two pi raised to n determinant m21 exponential minus half x2 minus C21 transpose M21 inverse X2 minus C21. That gives you the joint, the conditional probability distribution. Okay, just by knowing the mean, the conditional mean and the conditional covariance, you know exactly what the conditional probability measure is. Another thing to note here is that x1 appears linearly in this particular uh, equation and then x1 doesn't appear in the covariance matrix at all. The covariance doesn't depend on x1, whereas the mean depends on x1, but this dependence is actually linear in nature. There is some matrix which is fixed, constant matrix, which gets multiplied by x1, and then there is some other vector that gets uh, added to that particular matrix, so, or rather vector. So that's another feature of Gaussian distributed random variables that the conditional mean is linear function of x1, and the conditional covariance is actually independent of x1. Uh, and, and so it, it's just a constant, right? So this, these are all constant, so you can just compute the conditional covariance fairly easily. So that's all I wanted to cover today. Uh, I think we are out of time. Uh, I have already given you this, uh, uh, this handout. This handout is also there on Carbon in the folder called handout, course handout. So you will have access to this in the next class, which is on Monday. We are actually going to cover the multivariate normal distribution uh, when x2 is a linear function of x1. So how do we compute the uh, the conditional mean and the conditional covariance in those cases. So we'll talk about it on Monday and then we'll move on to the next topic. Thank you.